This is what we're going to talk about. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ. Apostle of Christ. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives also in you. For this reason, Timothy, young people, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Let's jump to uh, verse 13. What you have heard from me, young people, Timothy, Brian, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know, all preachers got to have a title. Got to have a title. So we're calling this the good deposit. The good deposit. What is the good deposit? The value of mentoring. The value of mentoring. The definition of mentoring is this. Someone who teaches or gives help and advice to a less experienced and often younger person. Okay, we're going to say it one more time, and it's on your screen. The definition of mentor is someone who teaches or gives help and advice and advice to a less experienced and often younger person. Now, one of the things that, that I recognize when it comes to mentoring is not just about, about our young people. All of us can, can identify with somebody either on your job, or maybe you can, you can think through a, a teacher or, or an advisor or, or a parent or an adult who poured something in you. They saw something in you that was valuable and said, you know what, let me help you with that. Let me direct you with that. Because sometimes we don't always know as young people. We, we're doing these things, but we don't actually know that this is something that could be really valuable or something that can move into a career, something that you're destined to do. And so we need these people to help us formulate those ideas and set out a plan. So it's not just for young people, because even me, this is my second go in, standing up here behind the pulpit. I need mentoring. I need, I, and I'm telling the young people, don't, don't think that it's just y'all who need mentoring. We adults, we need mentoring. I need somebody who's going to invest in me, who's going to coach me, who's going to develop me, who's going to say, hey, Brian, that was good right there, man. Come on, let's keep working with that. Okay, Brian, you want to tweak that? You want to do this? Come on and sit with me. Let me show you how we do that. I, I still need that. I still need that. But since this third Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to focus a lot on the kids. And in fact, I'm going I'm to I'm do this this way because I don't want to alienate anybody. We got, we got some points that we're going to talk about. We got a few points for the young people. And because we got so many adults in here, I got some stuff for you as well. Okay. Now, one of the books in our reading, uh, uh, it's a really, really easy read. And I always, I, I, I encourage all leaders, ministry leaders, uh, uh, children's ministry, youth pastors, whoever you are. There's this book that I'm reading. It's called uh, 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 Transforming Children into Spiritual Champions. It's a book by George Barnum. And, uh, and, and it's titled, Why Children Should Be uh, the Church's Number One Priority. Why Should Children Be our, the, the Church's Number One Priority? We're talking about succession planning, in other words. We, we spend a lot of time with all, all other kind of things that we do. And we do a good job here. We do, we do a lot of things for the youth. But the question out there that we're going to be having to think through in time is, when it comes to truly investing our resources, and I ain't going to mess with the financial resources today, but at some point, we got to talk about even the financial resources. But resources is everything, all of our energy, all of our efforts, including our resources, those things should most importantly affect our youth. Because the youth are the future of the church. 
There's a generation that's passing away. We, we, we know this. I always ask the question, and I asked the question to, to Lamar and myself, and Quentin was together, Pastor Earl, and I asked the question, if all of us were, were, were going somewhere to an event, and we were in a plane, or we got in an accident, and the Lord calls all of us home, will we be ready with the next plan? Do we have another worship leader ready? Do we have another pastor ready? Do we have other youth, do we have other ministers ready to go? Do we have other youth and children ministry workers ready to go? Do we have another musician ready to go? On your jobs, if someone leaves out of there, are you ready to go? And if you can't say yes, then we got to take a look at that. We got to take a look at what I like what George Barna says in his book. He says, if you want to have the greatest possible impact to achieve a lasting legacy of spiritual dividends, then consider employing those resources in the ministry of young people. Y'all get that? If you want to have the greatest possible impact in achieving the, a lasting legacy of spiritual dividend, dividends, then consider employing those resources to the ministry of young people. Now, I'm going to be quick with this. Young people, uh, I know y'all see me standing up here a lot, and I know you might think that I'm really confident and, and I'm really outgoing. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, when I was a kid, I hardly ever talked. I was really, really quiet. My mom would say, I know, ain't that something? <laughs> I've gotten better at it. But as a kid, I had, I had a lot of self-confidence issues. I, I was really, really introverted. Uh, I have a lot of self-esteem issues. Um, the one thing that I did have, I had a love for music. And so, and, and growing up in a home with my father and with my mom, uh, my mom would tell you, Brian was always in his room, just in his room, listening to music. That's all I did. That's all I did. But I always went with my dad everywhere he went. Even before he was a Christian, I would go with him. He was in his group. I was five, and I was listening to all this music, and then when he became a Christian, my parents became Christians, my dad was always singing everywhere. He was always singing everywhere, and I would go with him to all these different churches. So this is what happened. So I'm 17 now. This is probably in 79, something like that, maybe 80. Um, I'm sitting at the table, and my dad takes another phone call, right? And there's another church who's called because he's always going to sing it. He said, yep, this is George Lowe. No. I'm not going to be able to make that one today. I can't come, I can't come that Sunday because I got something going on. But my son, he can be there. He can go. And I'm sitting there like, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. I don't, I don't sing. I don't, I've never sang in front of anyone. I've never sang. I didn't sing at church. I didn't, I didn't let anybody hear me sing. I only sang in my bedroom all by myself. And so George Lowe is sitting there. Yep. My son is going to be there. Give me the time again. How many songs you want? You want two? I'm like, no, I can't do two songs. <laughs> I don't want to do one song. Where am I going? And my dad is sitting there like, yep, yep, he'll be there. And then, then I can almost hear the person, and they're like, so your son? Yep, my son, Brian. And I can almost hear the person say, well, can he sing? Because <laughs> I heard my dad's response, yeah, he's just as good as I am. You'll be blessed by him. And so he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, so he hangs up. And instantly we go from father and son to now we're into Paul and Timothy. Because this is what dad did. Dad said, son, I know that you're nervous. I know that you're fearful. But God doesn't give you a spirit of fear. Listen, and this is when he got into the Paul realm. He said, listen. You have been following me and you've been watching me and you've been gone and you've been gone with me all these years. You have the template. Do what I do. Do what you've seen me do. The same way I structure it, the same way I present it, the same way I present the word and encourage, just do what I do. How do I know you do that? The same spirit that lives in me. He also lives in you. So go. So go. So what did I do? I went. And that was the introduction of how I got, Zachary, I'm going to tease Zachary. Can you imagine, can you imagine your dad on the phone? Yeah, this is Howard Earl. And you sitting there listening to him, 
and you just doing your thing, doing it around. No, I can't make that. I can't make that. But my son Zachary, he'll be there. What? It's the same thing. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Now let's move it to our text. First of all, what we got to do is we got to cover who Paul, this relationship between Paul and, uh, and Timothy. If you look in Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 1, Paul is already, Paul, who's an, he's an apostle, he's already teaching and he's preaching. We know some of his work. He's active. He's doing, he's doing his work. But he comes to a city called Derby, where Eunice, uh, Lois, the grandmother and mother of Timothy, and where Timothy is living. Now, Timothy also has a father, which is another point. Mentoring isn't just about uh, single-parent homes. Timothy had a full home. He had a mother, father, and all that. Now, his dad wasn't necessarily a Christian, but he had, he had parents. He had, a, he had a support group. But the mother and grandmother said, have you, have you met my, my son and my grandson, Timothy? He's in the Lord. He's already a disciple. He's teaching. He's working. So Paul goes over. He meets them, and instantly they have a connection. And what does Paul do with him? Come on with me. You're going. So that was in Acts chapter 16. Now we're going to move to 2 Timothy. Now the, the letters of Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, these are letters that Paul is writing to Timothy and to Philemon, uh, uh, letters of, of encouragement, letters of, of, of instruction. They are always talking to the leadership of churches of how the you know, alignment. Tell the deacons to do this. Tell the elders to do this. Make sure the church is doing that. So these are the things that Timothy is doing uh, along, with, along with Paul. Now, here, are, here again are just a few things that we're going to point out. Again, adults, I'm going to start with you. Three quick things for the adults. They're going to be really, really simple things. You're going to see it right in the text. And then young people, young people, let me see your hands. I, I don't really know where all the young, where are you, uh, 35, 40 down to, you know, the other thing that might be helpful on Thursday Sundays, if, if, if we carve out, <laughs> y'all all in the back. Why y'all all in the back? This is supposed to be Thursday Sunday. And then we got some young people, some other people like Mary, who's still trying to get in that young people group. I see you, Mary. I see you, Mary. It will be helpful if, if on Thursday, Sunday, so that we know who we're talking to, that we carve out some space so we can also, I, I like to, to talking directly to who I need to talk to, but I, I see you back there, young people. So three for the adults, three for the, for the kids. Here's the first one. Adults, to be a good mentor, Paul established a personal relationship with Timothy. We, we ain't, ain't got to really go world deep with it. Okay. Where do we see that? Where do we see that? We see that in verse two. Paul says, uh, uh, and keep it with the promise of the Lord, to Timothy, my dear son. Now, if you notice in the letter, again, this is a letter. He didn't just write a letter that just said, to Tim, or to my dude, or just blank. He said, to Timothy, my dear son. That means he's developed something with Timothy, a love and an affection for Timothy uh, through their relationship that now he's considering him his son. So what do mentors do? Develop a personal relationship with your, with your mentees. You can't just say that you're a mentor and that you're going to establish this thing and you don't have any kind of connection with them. That's not going to work like that. When you find somebody who wants mentoring and if you know that you're going to be a mentor, you need to actually be engaged and involved with the mentee. They need to know that you care about who they are, not just about where they're trying to go, but care about them personally. Okay. Now, as it, what, and then also what he does with that is what I love about what Paul, he said that in verse four, he said, recalling your tears, I also long to see you that I may be filled with joy. In other words, Paul is loving, Paul is, 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 uh, is also encouraged with the relationship with Timothy. He's getting something from it as well. He is getting something from it. It's not just about him pouring in, but something about Timothy that's making him also say, as he writes this letter, I long to see you. And when I do, in fact, I'm recalling your tears and I'm, I long to see you. So that I, I want to also be filled with this joy in seeing you again. Mentors always have personal relationships with their mentees. That's vital. Number two. Paul prayed for Timothy. I told you, we ain't got to go deep with this. It's, it's right there. And I ain't talking about no money. We're talking about personal relationship. 
I didn't say you had to take them to lunch. I didn't say you got to go give them this or give them that. If you choose to do that, that's awesome. That's an investment. That's awesome. But you got to also pray for them. You got to pray for them. Where do we find that? In verse 3. Verse 3, Paul says, I thank God whom I, ser whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. It's cool to text. It's cool to reach out. It's cool to go to lunch. But if we're talking about a spiritual thing, if we're talking about reaching them uh, where they are and having the Holy Spirit guide some of that, not only your conversation, but where they are, you got to be praying for them. You got to pray for them. And, 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 and the, the word that jumps out to me is constantly. Paul is saying, I constantly remember you in my prayers. It can't be just this haphazard thing. Y'all got to keep praying for these young people. Okay. What's the first one? Adults. What's the first point? What's the second one? Awesome. And what I love, what, and this is what I love about, uh, what I loved about that, that whole point of how, how Paul, uh, because again, Paul is writing this letter actually from prison, which means Paul really had a right because they were getting ready to kill Paul. Paul really had a right to kind of be selfish. Say, man, you know what? I got my own stuff going on right now, Tim. I know they're going to kill me. But what does he do? Even in his distress, he still says, because of my love and affection for you, my relationship with you, I am still thinking about you, Timothy, because I know God has purposed you. And I want to encourage you and lift you up, even as I'm going through. I love that about Paul and, the, and his relationship. Number three, for the adults, Paul praised and encouraged Timothy. In other words, he, he affirmed Timothy. Where do we find that? Verse, verse seven or verse six. For this reason, I remind you to fan it to, to uh, no, he, uh, uh, verse five. I reminded to, of your sin. I, I, verse five. I reminded of your sincere faith. What he was doing and what I was doing with these young people right here is I was letting them know. See, see the praise, it, it, it has to also, you also, you don't just kind of, even when we mess up, that's what I appreciate about the mothers and, and you guys here. Even when we mess up, y'all don't just pounce on us and just say, you should have just had it. No, what, 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 what affirmation actually does as you move into your correction, you always should start with affirmation and praise. You did a great job with that. You did a really good job building that or, 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 or writing that or drawing that. Even, even when us as kids that didn't do everything we should have done, you did a really good job uh, doing the yard, and then you kind of move into some of your corrective. But this is what I also need you to do, Brian. Does that make sense? You got to affirm them. You got to affirm them. And what, and what Paul was doing, he was affirming Timothy of his minister of gifts, of the gifts that he has. He recognized that Paul, that, uh, that Timothy needed this affirmation. And, and, and the other thing that you may not know about this text, Paul and Timothy, uh, uh, if Paul is writing a letter, that means they're separated. They're no longer together. Paul was somewhere else. Timothy is a young guy in the ministry, so he needed to write this letter to get to him through his relationship, let him know he's praying for him, but he needed to let him know, I know that you're struggling, because I remember your tears. I remember the frustration. It's hard work in the ministry. I know that. But when he starts moving into with the affirmation, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. I know you have it. That's the praise part. I know you got it. You got it, Timothy. That's what dad was saying to me. Ryan. I know you're afraid, but you got it. You got it. Keep going. Keep going. Paul reminds Timothy, and, I, and he, he reminded us through his tears, uh, that he reminded him also that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, of being timid, but he gives us a, a spirit of power, love, self-discipline. Adults, what's your first one? What's the second one? What's the third one? Praise. Praise and encouragement. That is so very vital. Young people, now let me see you. Let me see your hands again. This is for you. These three are for you. I see you. I see you. I see you, Ronald. <laughs> I see you, Ralph. Now, young people, this is for you. Now, through this, 
And this is, this is the other thing that, 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 that struck me when it came to my dad and when it comes to other people who, who affirm my gifts. And as we affirm your gifts, young people, you got to know, don't take offense. Because we see some, when we tell you, I see you doing that. I see you singing. You have the spirit of worship. Have you, have you got this great voice? Have you thought about, or, you know, have you thought about what you actually do with that? And some of us sometimes, even as adults, I, I did the same thing with my, with my dad, obviously. No, I don't see myself doing that. Don't take offense of what the adults may see in you. Don't take offense to that because sometimes we just don't see what they see. We're still, we're still, we're, you're still cultivating. You're still growing. The God, God is still nurturing you and growing you. But there's some things that through experience and through time that sometimes, and through spiritual uh, uh, intervention at times where God is speaking to someone. And my, 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 aunt, my, my cousin Ann kept saying that to me for years. Are you sure you shouldn't be preaching? No, I shouldn't be preaching. <laughs> I sing songs. I don't preach. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to pray on that. So young people, here's your first one. Paul prepared Timothy for his teachings and instructions. Where do we see that at young people? Verse 13. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to make sure I can get ahead of myself. Nope. You know what? I'm going back. I'm going back. I don't want to do prepare. I want to do potential. That's what I want to do. I want to do. We see your potential, young people. That's where I was going with that. We see your potential. It's why we're saying what we're saying. We're seeing what God is doing. We're seeing that he's cultivating something. Now, let's talk about what Paul is saying in, in verse 6. Look at verse 6, young people. For this reason... I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. Now, young people, have you ever been to a campfire or have you ever been somewhere where uh, maybe your uncle, Uncle Bo, was trying to start a, uh, a fire or, 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 or tried? I ain't going to do the Google, Google, Google joke, trust me. Uh, he, they're trying to start a campfire or something, and they show and, and they show you uh, uh, how to begin that fire, and, and it starts with a flicker. You got to get the right kindling. You got to get the right thing so they can connect, so they can start growing. Once that fire starts connecting, you start to kind of see this smoke. You kind of start seeing this smoldering. You kind of start seeing it build up, and then they tell you. Then what they tell you? They tell you to just just blow on it a little bit. In other words, they're, they're, they're cultivating it. They see, you they see your potential. In other words, young people, in order to get to full potential, your gifts, they don't come into full bloom. That's what Paul is saying. When Paul is saying, fan the flame of your gift, he's saying, work at it. Work at it. You can't expect to be LeBron or Steph Curry or, in my era, Dr. J., uh, or Michael Jordan. You know what I love? In fact, what I love about athletics is there's a process that, and I always look at the great athletes. When I look at folks, I look at folks who do it well. I look at folks who do it excellent because what I'm going to learn from them is how their pattern of how they became successful at it. So young people, you got to watch and you got to study how these people become great at what they do. So when you see Steph Curry, and you and you don't don't just look at all the shots he's taking and all these shots he's making. You got to then look at what he's doing to prepare to be successful at that. That's fanning the flame. When it comes to your to, to the gifts that you have, when you're running track, when you're doing all these things in athletic, I guarantee you, if you just wake up out of bed and never go to practice, and all of a sudden you're going to show up at the game, it's not going to work. And don't think you're just going to automatically be Steph Curry or LeBron James or Michael Jordan. What I love about them, and what I love about what people say about them, that's what I first pay attention to. If you ever notice that on sports, on, on the sports, uh, when they talk about these great people, their, co their, their team members, they always say, what I love about Michael, what I love about Steph, they're the first runs in the building. They're the first ones in the gym. They're the last ones to leave. Even after all the workout is done, Steph Curry still goes and he spends another hour and a half with dribbling. 
and shooting skills and shooting drills. Michael Jordan, when he got done uh, uh, playing, he would go to the gym. He would go to the weight room and work out. That's fanning the flame of your gift. Don't sit on your gift. And don't think just because you want to do it, that's what I want to do, then all of a sudden you're going to wake up and you're going to be this Steph Curry. It don't work like that. Well, Paul is reminding you, young people, fan the flame of your gifts. Keep working at your gifts. Don't give up on your gifts. Incorporate another thing. Okay, I'm going to learn how to do this a little bit different. Then I'm going to incorporate that. It's going to take some time. I'm still doing the same thing. I'm fanning the flame on my gifts. i got to learn how to do this a little bit better. Next time I do it, I'm going to incorporate that a little bit differently. That's what fanning the flame of your gifts are. Okay? We see your potential, young people, fan the flames. Number five, B, Paul says, uh, uh, Paul prepared Timothy for his teachings. Now we're going to go to verse 13. Paul prepared Timothy by his teaching and instruction. What did he say? What you heard from me, Timothy, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things that I, that I picked up on is when he talked about uh, pattern. Young people, what we mean by pattern is somewhat of the script. In other words, let me say it like this. Coming to church every Sunday... You kind of see how we how we do things in worship service, right? We we have greeters at the door. Um, uh, we come in. We're prepared for worship. At a certain time, we do our worship. We always have a time of prayer, of giving, uh, of of affirmation. Uh, we have call of discipleship. We do all those things. That's that's the pattern. Those are the things that you do. It's it's, it's like the routine. It's the routine. Well, Paul is saying that's what my dad said to me when I told you about the testimony. What my dad said. Just, re just do what I did. Remember what I did. He set the pattern for you and already showed you how to do it. Young people, we're showing you how to do that now. All you have to do is do that. But he also said with faith and with love. Now, what, what he's saying is at some point, and this is kind of adults, this is kind of where we kind of get tripped up. We think that young people are supposed to keep doing it the way we do it. Don't get twisted what I mean by the pattern. What I mean by the pattern is what we do when it comes to, 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 the, to the fundamentals of, of worship and Christ and, and ministry. I'm not saying that they can't change some things up. That's not the pattern that I'm talking about. We got to give them room to grow. We got to give them room to stretch because they're young people. In fact, the meeting that we were at with Lamar and myself, uh, uh, Garrett Fox, uh, 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 Pastor Earl and Q, uh, that was the thing that Pastor Earl actually said. He said, man, I want y'all to be totally creative when it comes to these young people. I understand they got a totally different energy. If they want, if they want Christian DJs, get Christian DJs. If they want to have a Christian rap concert, if y'all want to do all these things, think outside the box, do those things. But what Pastor Earl said, as long as it's about what we do here at New Hope when it comes to the foundations of Jesus Christ, as long as his word, as long as his truth, his worship, the things that we do, then do that. That's what he's talking about. So be creative. Be creative, but keep the pattern. Keep the pattern. Young people, I'm going to ask you the same thing. What was your number one? What was it? Yeah, say it, say it out. What was number two? Preparation. Preparation. Keep the pattern. Keep the routine. Here's your number three. Protect the gift. Protect the gift. Protect the gift. What, where do we get that from? Verse, uh, verse 14. And in fact, I want to read this. I want to read this again, but I want to read it from, uh, I want to read this from the Message Bible. Uh, so keep, so keep, so keep at your work this faith and love rooted in Christ. Keep it exactly as I set out for you. It's as sound as the day you first heard it from me. Guard this precious thing placed in your custody by the Holy Spirit who works in us. What is he saying? There's a way to protect that. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have him working in you. What do you do with that? You protect that. You guard that. You don't let anything infiltrate that's valuable to you like that. Because in essence, what he's doing is, how do you protect that? What, what, what he's telling us and, and, and guarding it, 
What the Lord is saying to, the, to us is, if, if, I gave you, if I gave you the keys to my car, I'm entrusting you to take care of it. I'm giving it to you to handle it with care. Whatever way you want to say that, I'm, I'm leaving it in your hands. And I'm expecting it to come back the way it was. So take care of it. That also means, young people, you can't squander the gift. Don't squander the gift. Paul, in the Message Bible, uses the word precious. It's valuable. It's delicate. That means you got to make sure you take care of your body. If you're, if you're an athlete, take care of your body. Do the right things when it comes to your body. When it comes to your spiritual gifts, do the right thing. Make sure you're nourished. Make sure you're staying prayed up. Make sure you're not being, uh, uh, being double-minded about this. Don't, don't do one thing with your gift during the week, and then you come back on Sunday and do something else with your gift. Give it all to the Lord. He's entrusting us to do that. He's saying, guard it. Take care of it. And trust, I, I am entrusting this with your custody, meaning I'm giving this to you. I'm giving this to you. This is now in your custody. It's in your hands. Don't squander the gift. Don't squander the gift. Young people, you got that? This is how I'm going to leave it. We got to, again, I have not talked about money. I haven't talked about any of those things. I do believe that there's a, there's a place for resources uh, when it comes to our young people. But most importantly, I think it begins with this. It begins with partnering with our young people or with others who are new to the faith. There are some men and women in here who are still wrestling with their gifts and their call, and they're trying to figure it out. We need to partner with them, sit with them. Let's walk through this. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's see where the Lord is, is, is moving you. There's people also who are struggling in marriages. Um, there's kids. There's all kind of things that we can get together and partner with these, with these individuals so we can work through these kind of things so they have that kind of support. But we're committed, young people, to praying for you. We're committed to partnering with you. We are, as, as the adults, we're committed to affirming you, affirming you and your gifts. And we're going to give you room to grow. Whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is you need from us, we're going to make sure you have those resources. Whether it's through our experiences or even financially, we're going to make sure that you have the resources because one day you're in charge. Just like my father said, you got to go. Go do it. I'm going to wrap up like this, speaking of my father. The day before my dad passed, I was with him. I was always with dad. I mean, I, again, I grew up loving being with my father. I was always with him. Loved being with him. I got great parents, period. My mom and my dad. My mom was, all, yeah. I have incredible parents. But their personalities are different. My mom was the typical, you know, she, she, she's about her kids, she's at home, but she was extremely supportive when it came to my dad. And to, and to me, because I was the only other one who was kind of into that ministry role, they never missed anything. But when my dad got sick, we were especially with him. Uh, we didn't know if dad, we didn't know if dad would be here the next day or next minute uh, because of this, the severeness of his, of his illness. But God brought him through some very difficult times where he would ultimately, he came home after uh, four or five months in the hospital, uh, rehab at Mary Freebed. Dad finally came home January 2nd. And in March, uh, the day before he passed, just like I always was, I was with him. Came over to the house, sat with mom and dad for a while, we're talking. And me and dad, we always did that thing. We did everything. We can, we can talk about everything. We talked about family. We laughed about stuff. We talked about sports. Dad at one point finally said, uh, I asked him, I said, hey man, you hungry? He said, yeah, I can eat. And so that's what I'm grateful to God about. God gave me not only those few months to be with dad, well, he gave me another day to be with dad so I can sit with him, talk with him, chew the fat with him, pick his brain, talk about ministry, even cook one more time for my dad because I love to cook. So he said, yeah, man, I got some fish thawed out in there. Can you cook it for me? Yep, I can do that. So we go into the kitchen. He wheels on in there because my dad was paralyzed at the time. So he kind of wheels on in there and I'm cooking and we're just talking. We do what we're doing. We're talking, we're laughing, talking about everything. I sit down 
and dad is dad finishes eating uh and then he goes just like from 1979 now I'm 53 we go into Paul and Timothy mode just like that it went from all the things that we talk about in life even his sickness he then went to hey son how you feeling about your call and I said dad I don't want to do it I don't want to do it he said I know it, son I know you've always been like that you you never felt that you were good enough you always felt like you, you can't speak in front of people you always kind of go to the extreme of what you can't do but I'm telling you son God called you for a purpose and I am convinced son that the same spirit that lives in me also lives in you it lives in you so this is what he did he then went further into the Paul and Timothy mode he said and this is how you do it son first he said so when is he said have you got a you got a uh, you, you got a, a, a first date yet pastor Earl talked to you yet I said no Rev ain't talked to me yet he said he will he probably wait for me to come back let him know I'm coming back Sunday I said all right I'll let him know he said so and then we started talking about the first sermon which is the sermon that I preach in my in my initial sermon and he was like yeah good points good points gave me some points gave me some thoughts and then he flipped back to Paul mode you got to remember this son first of all God created you for a purpose he has uniquely uniquely gifted you for this very reason he had you go through all these experiences he had you go through all this time, all these trials for this very reason, to move further in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, son, don't be afraid of doing that. You go. You go. You know, how do, how do you go? Number one, son, you have to prepare yourself. He gave me all these same points. This is where I got the message from. He said, you got to make sure you prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. How do you do that? You get into the word. He says, son, if you simply teach the word and let the word speak, you don't have to do anything else. It is the word. And it is the power of God that will transform and change lives. So even if you, and this is, these are, this is, this is our actual conversation. He says, so even if it's five minutes or whatever you choose to do, as long as it's in the word of God, and you bring out those points, you let that speak. The second thing you got to do, son, in being prepared and studying, trust your, trust your gifts. Use all your gifts. Use everything that God gave you. In other words, young people, my dad was telling me, fan the flame of your gifts. Keep developing your gifts. Use everything that God gave you. Use your voice. Use your leadership. Use everything you've been doing in your experiences for the kingdom of God. Then the other thing he told me, make sure you get with somebody who can mentor you. How do you do that? Not only do you, do you recognize how to use your gifts, but you've also, uh, uh, you've also had a pattern that was set before you. You've had a lot of good teachers that you have seen and have been a part of from Pastor Starla Washington, who's my godfather, and he talked about Pastor Earl. You got Earl. You got Lanier. You got all these other guys who are around you. Make sure you get with them. Study them. Study their teachings. Study how they prepare. Study how they connect their points. Sit with them. You got the pattern. And you got the Lord in you. And then the final thing Dad said was, don't be afraid. Stand in boldness. Knowing that we're proud of you. Knowing that we love you. And the very last thing he said as he was cleaning up his plate, he said, you know what, Delay, I do have one more thing I want to say. And don't take a long time doing it. He said, son, it don't take that long. <laughs> and I'm going to say, daddy, I'm still feeling miserably at that last one. But I'm fanning the flame of my gift, Pop. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. My father recognized that his son, the same with his son, the same God that lives in him, he was convinced that he lives in you. I praise God for that, for having 
awesome parents who knows the Lord, who affirmed our gifts, who prayed for us, supported us, encouraged us. Keep using your gifts. Keep going. Keep going. Because at one, at some point, just like Paul, George Lowe leaves. And then you're left there to deal with the pattern, the script. Being timid. Being hurt. But through the power of God, I know that this is where I'm supposed to go. Young people, we're going to do the same thing with you. We encourage you to keep going. Keep moving. Don't give up on God. Use your gifts. Use all of them. Be creative. Stay with the Lord. Don't fear. God is with you. Because the same God who is in us is also in you. God bless you.